on today's episode of Mile Higher. It's a different type of case because Rachel was a confidential informant. In this situation, be consulting with an attorney before you do anything or say mm -hmm. yes to anything the police are offering you. The police say that Rachel chose to do this, but with everything they were threatening her with, it really doesn't seem like she had much of a choice, does it? Unfortunately, Rachel chose to ignore precautions established in a previous briefing. It's just appalling to me that they ever thought this was a good thing to do in the first place from a pure safety standpoint. What's so mind-blowing to me is not only did they make all of these decisions, but they still stand by their decisions. You don't think she was pushed into it, coerced by your officers? Again, we don't threaten people to become confidential informants. They knew that they had somebody vulnerable that they could manipulate. They knew they were going to be able to scare her into doing this for them. The, the rewards of pulling this off far exceed the possible risks here. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 270. And today we are going to be talking about a case that definitely needs more discussion around it. I'm surprised it didn't get as much publicity at the time, although it was a different, a different time. time. Um, it's crazy. It was only 2007, but it feels like a whole different world. We're going to be talking about 23-year-old Rachel Hoffman and her murder. And it's a different type of case because Rachel was a confidential informant and things went terribly, terribly wrong. It's truly a tragic story and we have a lot of thoughts to get into. So we should probably just jump right in. Yeah, we do want to announce something that we're doing for Halloween this year. Oh, yes. We yes. do need to talk about that real quick. Real quack. <laughs> Real quack. Real quack. We're doing something new this year. Yes, we want to try are. this try this format out. We've never done this before on the show. I'm really excited for this. So this is something that people have been requesting for a while for us to do too. We've just never really gotten around to doing it. But no, no, I'm very excited for this because who knows what we're gonna end up getting mm -hmm. uh, from from putting this out there. But basically we're wanting to do viewer submitted paranormal stories here on Mile Higher. Which means is that you, yes, you, if you've had a legitimate paranormal experience and are willing to record a short video of yourself talking about what happened, short uh, is key, then we will perhaps consider having you featured in the episode mm -hmm. where we will sort of live react to your experience, yes. give our commentary on on what happened mm -hmm. and you know the more evidence that you can bring to the table yes, the better it's going to be key here people or i guess more detail and you know you're going to be facing the scrutiny of the people on the comments and in the public <laughs> you know so more evidence the better people are skeptical about the paranormal i'm a little skeptical about it and that's okay it's okay to be a little skeptical because until you've had an experience yourself i think we're all skeptical to some extent. Yeah. Right. To Until some extent. something happens. I mean, I believe in the paranormal. Yeah. Just the stories that are out there. Sure. You know, some are hit or, hit or miss for sure. So the only requirements that we have are that you submit it through our Google form, which will be linked in the show notes and description. And it must be filmed in a well lit area so we can see you. No, like under the covers in the dark. <laughs> We want to be able <laughs> to see your face. That could add to the effect, babe. Yeah, well, I mean, if you want to create the effect of, of a spooky effect to it, that's cool. But the video should be around <laughs> two minutes. Max. Or max. Like, uh, if it's a little bit more, it's okay. A little less, it's fine. But, like, nobody who does, like, a 10-minute video is going to make it into the final video. Unless it is something that is just, like, mind-blowingly crazy yeah. and there's yeah, tons we'll of video to evidence for there it. There might be some... You never you know. know. You never know what people people have out there. Yes. And if you have um, like a picture or a video that you took during this experience, if you want to like put it on the screen, um, you can that'd be send great. It in or you can send it in. Yeah. We but can put it on the screen. If you want to make my life easier and you know how to edit a little bit and just put it on the screen yourself, that'd be great. <laughs> if not, we can take <laughs> if care not, of it. Yeah, it's okay. Interview the ghost. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. If you can get an exclusive interview with a ghost, you definitely will get on the show. <laughs> So everything, all the information regarding that, how to, you know, where you upload and all that good stuff is mm -hmm. in the Google form. So make sure we won't, 
accept anything submitted through email or any other form on social media, it must go through the Google form because that's the way that we're going to organize it and be mm -hmm. able to actually go through the different submissions. Uh, but that is going to be open for probably the next couple of weeks because that's going to be towards the end of October that we do that episode. So the sooner that you can get your submissions in, the better chance you have of making it on the actual show. So yep. just want to put that out there. I think that'll be really fun as we kind of head into spooky season with fall in full effect. Now it is fall officially. It is, so, it is fall. Yeah. Yep. My favorite time of year. I love fall. It's I'm here for the, the, the cozy vibes, the stormy weather, the mm. snow we get occasionally here in, in Colorado. Mm, I don't want any it. of that part Cooler of weather. Cooler is good. Snow, I can wait. It's nice though when it's like a little like uh, pitter patter of snow or what do you call it? The <laughs> a pitter patter. Yeah. A flurry. Flurry, thank you. Snow flurry here and well, there. Well, it's not great in my house because Josh likes to keep the air conditioning on all year. So winter's pretty brutal for me. And snowy nights. It just makes it that much more cozier, though, right? <laughs> no, it means we can it. snuggle up and cuddle <laughs> That's and true. drink hot cocoa and yes. more reason to snuggle. Okay. Anyways. Anyway, enough banter. <laughs> Let's get into this case because this is truly wild. And like I said, we have a lot of thoughts here that we want to just share with for you all. a warning. This will probably mm -hmm. make you extremely angry. Yeah, it should. It should make you this, fucking pissed. This is this is probably one of the most fucked up cases we've ever covered here. On, it's truly on um, unbelievable. Yes. Thank you, Julia, for finding this case and bringing it to our attention, because this is definitely one that needs to be discussed. So let's jump in. So Rachel Morningstar Hoffman was born December 17th, 1984 in Clearwater, Florida to her parents, Marjorie or Margie Weiss and Irving or Irv Hoffman. And she was their only child. Ever since she was little, Rachel was a very vibrant, very energetic, fun, loving girl. And she was social. She loved being in big groups with other kids. Rachel was always a very good student, and she was really active in lots of different activities, everything from piano to dance, martial arts, softball, horseback riding, cheer, and plenty more. She was a carefree, happy, and honest person. She also loved to cook ever since she was a kid, and she was a good friend to others and very genuine, sensitive, a gentle type soul. Irv and Margie divorced when Rachel was very young, but they both stayed in the same area. Rachel was close with her stepdad, too. She jokingly nicknamed him ESD or evil stepdad, obviously, as a joke. Rachel was Jewish and very active in her family's temple. She met a lot of her closest friends through her faith, and she was devout. Her grandparents on her father's side were Holocaust survivors, and Rachel was really inspired by their strength. At her bat mitzvah, she impressed everyone by reading the entire Shabbat service in Hebrew. Very impressive. She did smoke weed occasionally in high school, as typical for many teenagers, but she maintained good grades throughout all of that. She was voted as party animal of the senior class, which no doubt made her parents a little bit nervous about Rachel going to college, and she would be attending Florida State University in Tallahassee in the fall. Rachel left a five-page letter for her father when she left for school and reassured him that she would be just fine. And his daughter was only a phone call away. In college, Rachel continued to earn good grades, a B average, and was going to be completing a dual degree program. She was very popular at school and had a lot of friends, which made sense because she was so cool and easy to get along with. Rachel was the type of person to always include others, especially if it looked like they were feeling left out. And she also of course, loved cooking her friend's delicious meals. She was also sort of a hippie. And growing up, Rachel's mother, Margie, was the type to wear long, flowy skirts and burn sage at home. And that way, Rachel definitely took after her mom. She really loved jam bands, specifically the Grateful Dead and live music. She loved attending local shows and dancing around in her signature fuzzy purple top hat. Rachel was a frequent festival attendee and loved taking road trips. She especially loved the ones held at the Spirit of Suwannee Music Park. She also had two cats named Jimi Hendrix and Bentley. She had a fake Facebook profile for Bentley. His favorite <laughs> musical artists were listed as Cat Stevens, Stray Cat Blues, and Pussycat Dolls. That's hilarious. It's amazing. Just shows her sense of humor. Rachel ended up getting accepted into a graduate counseling program, but she wanted to do something different. Attend culinary school and combine her passions for helping others with counseling and the culinary arts. She really wanted to try a new approach to counseling for kids who didn't respond well to traditional psychotherapy, sort of like how art or equine therapy integrates painting or horseback riding into counseling. She wanted to create sort of a new model using cooking. 
She felt like kids who didn't like the whole sitting on a couch in a room with a therapist might be open more while cooking alongside sort of a therapeutic chef, which seems like a good idea, honestly. I love that idea. I think that's so unique. I'm surprised. I wonder if there are programs where people do that, but I mean, the cooking can be very therapeutic. It is for me. I love cooking. Mm-hmm. I feel like you it just like that. puts me in a different zone. Mm-hmm. I kind of forget. It, it kind of forces you to forget about what's going on around you and focus mm-hmm. in on, on what you're doing. And I don't know, there's something relaxing about it. Plus, who doesn't like food? So, yeah, I think it might be good, too, for people that are recovering from eating disorders that like want to kind of rediscover like a love for food alongside like a trained therapist slash chef. So it's like any issues that come up, you know, around food yeah. can oh, kind of be addressed point. right there. And even for kids like with autism that, you know, oh, have yeah. food aversions that maybe want to work with the food aversions and like, you know, find ways to integrate like vegetables if they have texture aversions into like a pasta, like blending it or chopping it and seeing if that helps. Like, you know, that could yeah. be. Yeah. Mm. I think that's it's a really such a good point. Idea. I'm it's, surprised that's not utilized more often. Yeah, I've never really heard of it. I don't know if there are programs like that. It's just such mm. a shame because, you know, Rachel was that was her passion project and she never never got to see that happen. And I think yeah. it's definitely a loss. Like Yeah, well, think about all the people she she would have went on to help. Yeah. If if this horrible thing didn't happen to her, she would have probably done really great things in her life. Yeah, she definitely would have. So things really took a, you know, downward spiral starting on February 22nd, 2007. Rachel was pulled over for going eight miles over the speed limit. And for whatever reason, the police searched her car. And I'm assuming they probably smelled the odor of marijuana. And that was their, you know, probable cause for doing the search. But during the search, they found 25 grams of marijuana, which equates to almost an ounce, which here in Colorado, you're allowed to have an ounce of marijuana on you. It's not much. It's like a sandwich baggie. Like. It's no, it's no, an ounce is not not that much. No. So as a result of this search and seizure, Rachel was arrested and the judge put her on drug court supervision. For those that don't really know like the marijuana laws and, and where things are at with legalization. So Florida has notoriously been against marijuana legalization and, and in mm-hmm. recent years they finally you know, past medicinal marijuana, but they still have struggled heavily, which has been surprising to me to some extent Mm -hmm. that they haven't passed recreational marijuana because recreational marijuana is in like 30, 30 states or something like that now out of 50. So they have it on the ballot for 2024, which is good. Um, But in years past, it's, it's, you know, gone that way as well. And the courts have been rejecting putting it on the ballot. So the fact that it's going to be on the ballot is a good sign. And you know, back in 2007, marijuana was illegal everywhere, pretty mm-hmm. much. Um, so, you know, they looked at it very differently than they do today. But this probation program was set to last a year. Rachel was supposed to pass a monthly drug test and not associate with anyone who used or sold drugs. If she completed the program, her charges would go away. In late March of 2008, one of Rachel's friend's fathers died suddenly, and she immediately dropped everything to be by her friend's side at the funeral. As a result, she ended up missing one of those mandatory drug tests. The police responded to this by throwing her in jail for a weekend from April 4th to April 6th, 2008. And this jail time opened her eyes to the way nonviolent offenders were treated in the state of Florida. After all this, Rachel continued to smoke weed and she sold it on the side as well, but she wasn't moving large quantities of drugs or anything like that. She was just selling a little bit here and there to her friends on the side. And her recent stay in jail made her a lot more selective about who she sold to. But she wouldn't stay under the radar for very long because someone gave the Tallahassee Police Department a tip stating that Rachel was selling weed out of her apartment in March of 2008. And because of this tip, the police put Rachel on surveillance and ended up getting a warrant by collecting evidence from her garbage. So the police really thought she was like a serious drug dealer pushing large amounts of drugs through her apartment. And as a result of this warrant on April 17, 2008, Tallahassee police raided her apartment and they ended up finding six ecstasy pills, three volume pills, and 151.7 grams, which is equivalent to about five and a half ounces of marijuana. So their plan was, after finding this, was to charge her with possession of cannabis with intent to sell, possession of ecstasy, maintaining a drug house, possession of a controlled substance with intent to sell, and possession of drug paraphernalia. 
and some of these charges were felonies. Here is Police Chief Jones of the Tallahassee Police Department discussing the search and charges. And we found uh, roughly a quarter pound of, of marijuana uh, was present uh, during a search warrant. For sure. And if you were to hold that, how much would that be? Baggy. A baggy. Yes, a baggy. And Chief Jones says officers also found Valium and ecstasy. How much? It was, uh, I think uh, there were uh, six pills that, that were Six also pills? Found. Yes. Is that a lot? It's not, not a lot, but it's, it's enough to make it a felony. Ridiculous. This guy really pisses me off. I hate him. Like, he'll get, it gets yeah, way worse. Yeah, we'll, we'll be seeing a lot more of him. Mm-hmm. But you can already tell from that clip alone, just his stance on Rachel and yeah. what she was doing. And she's just a straight drug dealer in his eyes. Mm-hmm. It's so crazy, too, because the way he's like, well, how much is, the interviewer is like, how much is it? And he's like, oh, like a like a baggie. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, the pills. He's like, is that a lot of pills? And he's like, six pills. No, but it's still a felony. So we're still yeah. going to fuck her over anyway. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Yep. It's just so ridiculous. Mm-hmm. The law is the law in his eyes. So anyway. Well, not for them, though, as well. As yeah, yeah exactly. right. <laughs> Some laws True. don't apply. For everyone else but yeah. us. Right. But the police told Rachel that she could make all the charges go away if she acted as a confidential informant. Rachel was not arrested and not charged with anything police were threatening her with. And because she wasn't being charged, they didn't have to Mirandize her, meaning Rachel was not read her rights, including her right to speak to an attorney. So the police actually told Rachel not to contact her attorney. They said that if she did, her attorney would have to tell the drug court about the raid and the drug court would extend her time in the program. Which this is shady. Oh, yeah. Majorly shady because... You should absolutely be in this situation, be consulting with an attorney before you do anything or say Mm -hmm. yes to anything the police are offering you. Oh, for sure. Because again, at this time, she's not even being like formally charged yet. Mm -hmm. So they're so they're they're manipulating her into thinking she's already in this, you know, all this trouble and all of these bad things are going to happen before that's even a reality at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's just. It's just such a shame. It's extremely frustrating. So here's a clip of the state attorney talking about how he wasn't aware that she was an informant and the police, his uh, chief Jones, his response as well. And were you aware that she was being uh, turned into a confidential informant? No, sir, we were not. Should you have been told? We should have been notified, yes. Well, you know, hindsight, yes. Uh, would, would, would it have been a good idea to, uh, to call him, uh, to, to let, uh, let the state attorney know? Yes. Can't stand this guy. This guy's just such a sleazeball. Would it have been a good idea? Like, it's not a good idea. It's required. Yeah. And you didn't do it. Mm -hmm. You violated policy. So casual about that. Drug court also wouldn't let her be an informant if they found out. And if Rachel couldn't do informant work, then she was looking at a four to five year prison sentence, which is just mind blowing. And obviously, all of this probably scared the living shit out of her. For a 23-year-old, four or five years can seem like an eternity. And she had big plans for her future and didn't want to embarrass her family. And of course, she didn't want to go to prison for years and become a convicted felon. So Rachel agreed to become a confidential informant. The police say that Rachel chose to do this, but with everything they were threatening her with, it really doesn't seem like she had much of a choice, does it? The cop who gave Rachel the deal was the lead vice unit investigator, Ryan Pender. He told her that if the bust went wrong, the worst that could happen was Rachel would be fake arrested. Ryan saved his name in her phone as Pooh Bear, so a target wouldn't be suspicious if they saw him trying to call Rachel. And the TPD, they gave her no police training, no firearms training, no courses, no nothing. And she had never even so much as fired a gun in her life. Rachel didn't deal hard drugs and she wasn't a hardened criminal. So she wasn't prepared to do the type of bust that police ended up asking of her. Jones, once again, on training and coercion into being a CI. You don't think she was pushed into it, coerced by your officers, threatened with prison for charges that were never filed? Again, That's we yes. don't threaten people to become confidential informants. You don't. That's not part of how we operate. No, sir. What sort of training did she receive? Ryan, as far as the training, there are the, she, she receives, as far as training for, uh, as a CI, we don't provide training for uh, CIs. We, we, no, provide, no training we at all. provide instruction, but no, no training. No, sir. Was there a dry run? 
I'm not aware that there were, was a dry run, no, sir. Should there have been? Not in all cases. Uh, in this case? In, in this case, With it, a could, it, could, year old. It, it could have been an option for us to, to look at, but uh, was it done? No. Hmm. I appreciate these hard questions that Brian Ross is yeah. yeah. asking him, yeah, he, like point blank, pushing him. Because you can just see he's like, Ugh. he's just trying to yep. push all the blame off of his department, of course, and make it seem not as bad as it really is. But it's like, if you know anything about CIs and the way that CIs work, they're supposed to be believable. Like they're supposed to be people right. who have extensive history of, yeah. of doing mm -hmm. criminal acts. But, you know, and when you talk about narcotics and things like that, it's usually people have been, you know, they're higher level dealers, not first time offenders, essentially, that are put in these types of situations, let alone a, a young female um, put into a situation where she's going to then go bust two, two felons, as we'll find out. And so it's just appalling to me that they ever thought this was a good, good thing to do in the first place from a pure safety standpoint. And I think threatening maybe isn't the right word to use, but rather intimidation. Yes. They used intimidation mm -hmm. to intimidate her into basically believing that if you don't do this, then you're fucked. You're going to, to prison as a felon. Mm -hmm. And that's going to scare anybody. Anybody's going to be intimidated by that. But had she been able to consult with her attorney, it would have been a whole different, different situation that would have played out. But that was never given to her. They kind of, they knew that they had somebody vulnerable that they could manipulate. They knew they were going to be able to scare her into doing this for them. And ultimately in their minds, they're like, the, the rewards of pulling this off far exceed the possible risks here, mm -hmm. which as you'll see, is, is utterly mind-blowing to me. So as part of her being on drug court, she was not allowed to associate with anyone who did drugs, much less buy them. It was in her actual contract with drug court. If police wanted to use a drug court person as a CI, they would need to get permission from the state attorney's office. But they did not notify them. They wanted Rachel to set up her friends but obviously she didn't want to do that because she didn't want to ruin her friends' lives over small-time weed buys, so she didn't go through with them. In one case, the police wanted to set up her friend Dan, who Dan was a low-level weed dealer who occasionally sold other drugs. The police called Rachel to the station and had her call up Dan to set up a deal to buy ecstasy from him. But after the call, Rachel left the station and then called up Dan herself, and she told him that, hey, that call was a police setup. And surprisingly, Dan agreed to become a CI to work off some of his own prior charges. Because that's like the thing with CIs is like the, the promise is that you'll be able to work off those charges, get them expunged. And that ultimately helps you, you know, go forward in your life. But it is a very, it is very risky business mm -hmm. to be a CI. And CIs can get paid too, right? Yes. Yeah, they can, depending on the, the situation for sure. And Rachel was not paid. No. Yeah. Because I, I think there is, like, obviously in law enforcement, CIs are important because that's how you get to the higher level drug dealers because those guys aren't the ones, those are the hard guys to get and those are the ones that you want to take down in order to take care of all the low level dealers. So there is a need for CIs. It's just, there's a reason why there's procedures and you have to get permission from the state attorney's office. There's legal, per, you know, procedures that have to be followed before you go down that road. But they were like, no, we're not going to do that, likely because they would have said no. And so they decided to go against what what rules are in place for CIs to do it anyway. It's What's so mind-blowing to me is not only did they make all of these decisions, but they still stand by their decisions. Well, of course they do. They, they usually do because what are they going to do? Admit they're wrong? How often does that yeah. happen? Rarely. Very rarely. If you're in the market for some new earbuds, maybe some over your headphones or even a portable speaker, then you need to take advantage of Raycon's anniversary sale. They're offering up to 20 to 40% off premium audio experiences. If you've been listening to the show for the last couple of years, you probably have heard us mention Raycon. We're big fans of Raycon's everyday earbuds. I use them to fall asleep at night and they're by far the most comfortable earbuds that I have ever used and they're known for delivering high quality audio but at a fraction of the price. They also have other features like a 32 hour battery life and a perfect in-ear fit for all day wear and lasting comfort. Raycon has really achieved premium audio at a price that all of us can afford. It's no wonder they've racked up 78,000 five-star reviews. 
And this past year, they've expanded their entire business with the introduction of Raycon Home and Raycon Powertech. So needless to say, there's a ton to celebrate with this anniversary sale. And to thank everyone who's shown them support in the past six years, Raycon is offering 20% off everything on their site with select products up to 40%. This is the time to take advantage and cash in on some new premium audio electronics. I love that Raycon has expanded their product line. Their home tech includes a faucet filter, portable air purifier, room purifier. The new power tech line includes cables and other ways to charge your electronics. You definitely don't want to miss out on Raycon's anniversary sale. Celebrate Raycon turning six with their biggest sale of the year going on now. Hurry now to buyraycon.com slash milehire and use code birthday to get 20 to 40% off site wide. That's code birthday at buyraycon.com slash milehire to score 20 to 40% off. That's buyraycon.com slash milehire. So just based off of how Rachel handled that call with Dan, the police should have found out that she's already telling people she's a CI. So you can't do that. It's like rule number one. You can't disclose to anybody that you're a CI. So that would have disqualified her from being a CI moving forward. So the Tallahassee Police Department wanted Rachel to bust some of the people who supplied her weed, but she couldn't do it since some of these people had families and kids and they weren't violent offenders. So she asked Dan if he knew of any quote unquote bad guys that actually deserved to be set up. And that's how Rachel became acquainted with 23-year-old Danello Bradshaw and his stepbrother-in-law, 26-year-old Andre Green. They were both convicted felons who worked at a local window tint shop and dealt drugs and guns. Immediately when I hear guns are involved, that's a whole that's escalating yeah. it to a whole different level uh, of danger and risk. On April 21st, 2008, Rachel and Dan went to the police station. Dan told investigator Pender about two guys working at the tint shop who were quote-unquote big dealers in drugs and other illegal items, including guns. After they left the station that day, Rachel and Dan visited the tent shop and Dan introduced Rachel to Danello and Andre. Rachel and Dan visiting the two targets after leaving the police station was also a violation of their CI agreements. It's Tallahassee Police Department policy that if a CI proves to be untrustworthy or unfit for CI work, their agreements should be terminated. But again, this did not happen. Rachel came back to the police station the next day on the 22nd, and this is when that deal was set up. Rachel made a controlled call to Andre to set up the drug deal. The operation was going to be a buy bust, meaning Rachel would buy drugs from the target while the police watched, and they would move in after the deal to arrest the targets. But police didn't want to have Rachel do just simple pot deals that she was used to doing. No, get this. This is, this is insane. The police wanted Rachel to take $13,000 and use it to buy 1,500 ecstasy pills, two to three ounces of cocaine, and a semi-automatic pistol. So not just a couple ounces of weed. We're now yeah. talking about ounces of cocaine. Whole different level. Thousand plus ecstasy pills, but worst of all, a firearm. And obviously, she had no experience in this whatsoever. She never held a gun before. We don't, you know, as far as cocaine goes, there's no evidence that she was ever involved with that. So this is all completely new to her because ultimately the police wanted a big bust. They wanted something that would make the headlines, make the police department look good, but you know, something bigger than just busting somebody with a few ounces of weed. Cause again, bigger bust equal more money for the department, more recognition. And this was set to be one of the largest busts in Tallahassee history. And again, this would be Rachel's very first time being a part of a sting operation. She had no experience like this ever before. And it's crazy to me that they didn't even think it was necessary to run a dry run where they just <laughs> kind of mock out the scenario or even give her any sort of training or like heads up of like, hey, if this happens, this happens, yeah. this is how we respond, here's the plan. Mm -hmm. None of that as far as we know. And obviously a first time buy this big from some random college girl would no doubt be an immediate red flag to any drug dealer. They would immediately think that this person was a fed and that would put a big target on Rachel's back. And the literal narcotics division of the TPD would no doubt have to know this. At first glance, you'd think that assigning Rachel to such a big bust was them being incompetent. And to be fair, there is a lot of police incompetence in this case. But here, the choice to make Rachel a CI was something that they had to know would put her in harm's way. They knew. They just didn't care. If they got their bust, they could get all the recognition. If it went wrong, Rachel was expendable, like any other CI. And they could blame the whole thing 
on her, which unfortunately is what ends up happening. The police reassured her over and over that the worst that could happen was Rachel would be fake arrested. They told her that they would be watching her at all times, and if anything went wrong, the bust would be aborted. They told her repeatedly that she would be safe because they would keep her safe. But Rachel's boyfriend wasn't convinced. He was worried from the start that Rachel would get robbed. But she told him not to worry. The police were going to make sure nothing happened to her. And Rachel had told her mom that she was going to be working with the police on something that could be dangerous. But she was vague about the details. Um, Here's a clip from her mom's interview on Democracy Now! We're going to have that interview linked below. I think it's definitely worth listening to. So tell us she what happened when she said, Mom, I want you to surround me with your love and light because I'm thinking of doing something dangerous. And I paused and I said, Rachel, did you just hear what you said? No. What are you talking about? Don't do it. But what is it that you're talking about? If you know ahead of time that you're going to do something dangerous, that's enough evidence to tell you not to do it. And she goes, well, you know how I'm a criminal justice major? I thought it'd be really cool to, like, write a book about, you know, um, working undercover and exposing what it's all about. And I said, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard you tell me. I said, don't do it. And she said, Mom, don't worry, I'll be fine. And I said, don't do it. And all I knew was the word undercover. At that time, I didn't know informant. I didn't know the word snitch for like at least two years after that. And um, she said, well, I'll call you on Monday. We're going to do it on Monday. And I'll talk, you know, you, I'll tell you what's going on the whole way through. And when she called me, the policeman was there in the car. His name was Pooh Bear. And she was talking to him and giggling and acting like it was just an adventure and that he had her back and he would keep her safe and then it was all over. And I was certain that since she told me about it and he knew that I knew that it really was all over. So that's really suspicious that, yeah, you know, judging from that statement that he knew that she had told her mom, which is also not allowed. That's a violation of policy. So why did she continue to be a CI? Yeah, which no shock there. They were going to move forward no matter what. It was supposed to be one of the biggest busts in Tallahassee history. Like they had to make it happen. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So on April 25th, 2008, Rachel graduated from FSU with degrees in psychology and criminal justice. She was planning on going to culinary school in Arizona after her drug court program ended. Once the CI bust was finished, Rachel could start putting this whole thing behind her, or at least that was the idea. So it all began on May 5th. Rachel went to the tent shop wired up to talk to Danello. They agreed that the three of them would do the deal on May 7th. The meeting spot would be set for Danello's parents' house on the outskirts of Tallahassee with a Walmart as an alternative spot. Rachel had told them that the drugs were for her friends who were visiting from Miami and the gun was for her own protection. The two agreed to sell her the drugs and the gun. But Danello and Andre never actually planned on selling Rachel any drugs. They wanted to rob her and give her a bag full of aspirin instead of ecstasy. Two days before the operation, May 5th, a 25 caliber handgun was stolen from the car of a customer of the tent shop, and Danello was the prime suspect in the theft, which was something that police knew or should have known and probably should have taken into consideration. Rachel spent the entire morning with her boyfriend on May 7th, 2008. It was finally the day of the bust. Her boyfriend was very anxious about what was about to go down. Of course, I mean, as any boyfriend would be. Very scary um, situation to say goodbye to your partner and know that they're going into this completely unpredictable situation. I just can't even imagine. But just like she had been doing before, she told her boyfriend over and over again that everything would be fine. The TPD would keep her totally safe and that he didn't need to worry. So once Rachel got to the station, she was wired up. But here's the thing. The person who normally handled the wiring procedures for these types of operations was not there that day. So Rachel had to be wired up by somebody who clearly didn't know what they were doing. And because of this, Rachel was improperly wired. And it failed soon after she was wired up. 
There was also a wire placed in her purse, something that was against the police department's policy. Because keep in mind, she's carrying $13,000 cash in her purse. So if the targets do rob her, which seems like a very likely scenario, police knew this, then the wire placement would be absolutely horrible. It would give away the whole fact that she's undercover for the police and would put her in grave danger. Originally, the deal was supposed to go down at Danello's parents' house, but once Rachel got to the station, the targets changed the location to Forest Meadows Park. This is a public place where lots of families bring their kids to play, and Rachel was not familiar with the area. But police were still fine with the location change. They set up two arrest teams, a vehicle to block the target's exit, and a surveillance vehicle. Along with the teams at the park, they sent four officers in separate cars to drive north and south along the road where the park is located. They even had a DEA plane flying over the park area, but the trees in the park were so dense that the canopy cover made it basically impossible for the plane to see anything. After Rachel was wired, she began to drive up to the new location. At 6.28 p.m., Danello and Andre called Rachel and told her they were at Forest Meadows Park. At 6.34 p.m., she texted her boyfriend, quote, I just got wired up. Wish me luck. I'm on my way. He replied, quote, good luck, babe. Call me and let me know what's up. And Rachel wrote back, it's about to go down. At 6.41, Rachel called lead vice unit investigator Ryan Pender and told him the targets changed location again. This time, Rachel was told to meet them at a plant nursery 1.5 miles north of Forest Meadows Park. At the same time, Rachel turned into what she thought was Forest Meadows Park and said it was Meridian Park, which was just south of the correct one. At 6.43 p.m., Ryan Pender told Rachel over the phone that she made a wrong turn. He slowed down on North Meridian Road to allow Rachel to pull out and head to Forest Meadows. Ryan Pender parked at Meridian Park to monitor Rachel's wire from there. At 6.44 p.m., Danello and Andre called Rachel, and she told them she was pulling into Forest Meadows right now. But she didn't actually make the turn and continued to drive northbound past the park. An officer notified Ryan Pender that Rachel did not turn into the park at 6.45. The other officers said later that they thought Ryan Pender, or at least someone, had eyes on Rachel. But nobody actually did. And at 6.46, Ryan Pender told the other officers, quote, Uh, I lost her over the wire. So Rachel's other wire had failed, and now they had no audio surveillance of her. But Rachel had no way of knowing this. In her mind, the police could still hear her from both wires, and she had no idea that they had no visual of her. Ryan Pender tried to call Rachel multiple times, but she didn't answer, because she had been on the phone with Danello and Andre for two and a half minutes. Then she got off the phone at 6.47, So she likely didn't pick up Ryan's calls because she thought police could see her. You know, everything was good to go, like they had said over and over again. And Ryan Pender had just reached out to Rachel just minutes before to tell her she had made a wrong turn. So if they were tracking her then, there was no reason for her to believe that they weren't tracking her now. At 646, DEA Special Agent Lou Andres was driving past the plant nursery and spotted the targets in their BMW. To get to them, he needed to turn around and go southbound on North Meridian Road. Just as he was making that turnaround, Rachel slowed her car to let the targets pull in front of her. She was going to follow them to the New Deal spot. They passed Agent Andres just as he was turning around so he wasn't able to see them. He didn't know that Rachel was following the targets in the opposite direction he was now going. And when he arrived at the plant nursery, of course, the targets were gone. So now nobody had any visual on Rachel. The wires failed and they had no audio surveillance. She's completely on her own and they hadn't heard from her in three minutes. Rachel and the targets were about two miles north of every law enforcement officer and thanks to the dense tree covers, the DEA plane circling overhead was essentially useless. At 648, Rachel followed the targets as they made a left turn onto Gardner Road. The targets were leading Rachel to Gardner Road, which is a dead-end dirt road surrounded by undeveloped farmland. The other officers were 2.7 miles away at Forest Meadows Park, waiting for Ryan's orders. At that same time, Ryan called Rachel and managed to get through. She told him, I followed them from the nursery. We're on Gardner. It looks like the deal is going to go here. It's a dead-end street. And during this phone call, Ryan radioed the other officers and told them that Rachel was all the way at the end of Gardner Road and following them right now. Now, Ryan claimed that he told Rachel, turn around, turn around, do not follow them. Then the call ended. Ryan later told investigators, I had no response from her, which meant, you know, either she hung up on me or we lost the signal. At this point, nobody had eyes on Rachel. 
the DEA plane that would have been able to see Gardner Road, since there were no big trees, wasn't in the right spot. So obviously they couldn't see her. So there were 19 officers who were supposed to be watching her and none of them were. Only one of them even knew where Gardner Road was. At approximately 6.49, Rachel most likely arrived at the end of Gardner Road. The police were four and a half minutes behind her. At that time, Ryan radioed. She's probably with them right now in the car, so we need to move, move. Now, we don't know exactly what happened during those four and a half minutes, but we do know this. Rachel, who thought police were on top of her the entire time, probably thought she was safe when she parked her 2005 Volvo at the end of Gardner Road. This car was a gift from her father, and her father was back home in Palm Harbor with no idea that the TPD left his only child, his precious daughter, to be murdered by two known felons. It's very clear that once Rachel parked the car, she was approached by Danello and Andre, who never had any intention of selling any drugs to her. There's a good chance the killers checked Rachel's purse, likely to rob her of that $13,000 cash inside. And not only did they find the money, but they found the wire, which hadn't even been working. We know that at that point, the targets took out the gun that the police department told Rachel to buy from them. And we know they aimed the gun at Rachel and shot her three times in the chest and twice in the head. One of the shots actually tore off her fingers as she put her hands up to shield herself. Rachel cried out for help as she was killed. And she cried out for help of the police department, who promised that they would be right on top of her the entire time. And who also said, the worst thing that's going to happen from this is that you're going to be fake arrested. But when she cried out, there was nobody out there to hear her. One of the killers took off in the BMW, and the other put Rachel's body in the backseat of her car and followed the other out. By the time police got to Gardner Road, they were both gone. They found a single black flip-flop, tire marks, one used round of ammo, two live rounds, and six cigarette butts. But they didn't find Rachel or the target's vehicles, and there were no other signs of the three of them anywhere. A few hours later, the police found Rachel's iPhone in a roadside ditch miles away from Gardner Road. By 3 a.m. that night, the police were banging on Rachel's boyfriend's door, barking questions at him and asking him if he knew where Rachel was. Because in their minds, they thought maybe Rachel ran off with the money. But her boyfriend hadn't heard from Rachel. He thought she was still with the police since they were supposed to be looking after her safety. And when he asked where Rachel was, an officer told him, quote, she was with us until shit got crazy. I don't even know how you would process hearing that. I know. Imagine everything. Here it is right late at night. And like oh You hear officers God. at your house saying shit got crazy to you. <sighs> Jesus. At 2 a.m. the next morning, police called Margie and Irv. They told them that Rachel was missing and they should get to Tallahassee as soon as possible. They didn't give them any further information than that or even mention Rachel's work as a CI. So Margie, her husband, Irv, and the family's rabbi set out on the four-hour drive down to Tallahassee. And once they made it to the TPD station, Irv and Margie were taken to the narcotics unit, not the missing persons unit. Chief Jones told them that Rachel was missing, but they did not believe that she was in danger. Which if that is true, that is another just baffling statement to make when clearly she's in danger. If they can't find her and they can't find the two felons that she was supposed to meet. Chief Jones also did not mention that Rachel was working as a confidential informant. He said a search was underway and they should wait at her apartment for any further updates. So that's what they did. They kept the news on in Rachel's apartment and anxiously waited for any word from the police. Margie and Irv actually found out from the news that Rachel had quote unquote provided assistance during a police operation and foul play was suspected in her disappearance. Eventually police found Rachel's car and Perry under a tree next to a welding shop. The police's victim advocate assigned to the family told the family that they didn't find anything inside. When in reality, the sheer amount of Rachel's blood in the backseat of that car was so great that the vehicle was considered totaled. That's the, so sick. I that mean, is a glimmer of hope. They didn't find anything in the car. They didn't find any blood. Like she could be out there. She's still safe. And in reality, like it's drenched with her blood. Like they know what happened. Why aren't they saying anything then? Are they trying to like cover up what just happened and, and be like, you know, we have a major crisis situation for us here. We've got to like come up with how we're going to spin this story or or explain what happened that's what it kind of seems like to me yep definitely i truly cannot tell you enough how much josh and i love hello fresh how much of a lifesaver it is for us how much time it saves us oh my god our lives have become so busy especially now being parents running two businesses taking care of 
10 pets. We've got a lot on our plate, but one thing that we don't have to worry about is what's going to be on our plates tonight for dinner because HelloFresh has got us covered. Every day when we're coming home from work, Josh and I pull up our HelloFresh app and look at our options and we discuss which meal we should have that night. We all know that HelloFresh takes the hassle out of mealtime, but did you know it can also save you money? HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. That means less stress in your day and more money back in your pocket. Fall oftentimes feels jam-packed and HelloFresh makes whipping up a home-cooked dinner actually doable with quick and easy options, including their 15-minute meals. That's less time than it takes to get delivery. And with everything pre-portioned and delivered right to your door each week, it's really a no-brainer. And what's great is it's so flexible. You can stop start it at any time. You can skip a week. You can add things to your order. You can reduce the amount of meals. It's really customizable. Even recently, there was a week where I just wasn't really feeling any of the options, which truly has only happened to us once because they have 40 options every week. And normally we want many of those things and it's hard to narrow down what we want. But there was a week where I just wasn't feeling anything and I was able to just skip it. And that's so nice. I can't say enough good things about it. It saves us so much time, so much money, so much stress. You got to check it out for yourself. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 mile higher and use code 50 mile higher for 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50 mile higher and use code 50 mile higher for 50% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. The police were tipped off that Danello and Andre had fled to Orlando. They were found and arrested on the 8th and the following morning around 6.30 a.m. they led the police to Rachel's body. They had dumped her body in a wooded remote area outside of Perry, Florida, and this is some 50 miles southeast of Tallahassee. She was covered in a Grateful Dead sweatshirt from the trunk of her car and an orange and purple sleeping bag. At that time, Margie and her husband were stopping to get food at Publix grocery store. Margie was standing outside alone in the parking lot when she got the call from Irv. He told her, you need to come back to the apartment, and Margie just knew. She ran back into the store, frantically searching up and down the aisles and screaming, where's my husband? My daughter was just murdered. She arrived back at Rachel's apartment and her rabbi confirmed the horrible news. Rachel was dead and Margie and Irv's only child had been murdered. Meanwhile, reporters were setting up for a police press conference in Perry, near where Rachel's body was found. Rachel's devastated friends and family watched the news coverage from her apartment. And this is when the smear campaign began. Rachel's body had not even left that dry creek bed in Perry when TBD got to work trashing her name. As Rachel's body lay just a few yards away, TPD's media officer, David McCrane, blamed Rachel's own murder on herself. Here's the video. This morning at about uh, a little after six, uh, investigators from the Tallahassee Police Department had Mr. Green and Mr. Bradshaw transported back to Tallahassee. They led us to Ms. Hoffman's body. She is deceased. We are seeking additional charges against Mr. Green and uh, Mr. Bradshaw for murder. The family's obviously suffering. They are our primary concern right now. They are aware of the situation. Our hearts go out to them. Some things I want to tell you about Ms. Hoffman. Ms. Hoffman is a good person. She was cooperating in an investigation with the Tallahassee Police Department Spice Unit. We had established protocols in place to ensure her safety. At some point during the investigation, she chose not to follow the instructions. She met Green and Bradshaw on her own. That meeting ultimately resulted in her murder. It was all her fault. She didn't listen. We had established protocols in place. What are you talking about, dude? You yeah. That's you disregarded true. all the protocols. And the smears kept continuing. 2020, as we saw, did an episode on Rachel's case. That's the episode that we have been pulling the interview clips of. Police Chief, Chief Jones. Dennis yeah. Jones. Um, and in the episode, Brian Ross really goes pretty hard at him. Uh, as we saw, this is what the police chief had to say about Rachel and how TBD handled the case. And it's pretty shocking. Was she being watched by any of your officers? There were officers in the area. But was she being watched? Did anybody actually have an eye on her? My understanding is no, that there was not eyes on at that point. Your officers were not able to see her. They didn't, they didn't follow her. Not that I'm aware of. If she's going off the plan and she's yes. deviating or she's nervous or she's right. making mistakes, she's a 23-year-old recent college graduate, yeah. why didn't your officers move in right then and there and shut the whole thing down? 
That would have been ideal. Why didn't you do that? Uh, Brian, a, again, the, the ideal situation. No, this, but my this question was, is, why this, didn't that happen? Have you asked that simple question? I haven't asked that question because that's what we're finding out in but the investigation. Why wouldn't you ask that question? Isn't that the whole point here? When I'm given a chance to ask that question, I will ask that question. How long has it been since she died? How long has it been? May, May uh, the 7th. We know that uh, the plan that we had in place was deviated uh, from. It was, uh, uh, it was a change of plans. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, Rachel was, uh, decided to deviate from that plan and, and not meet at the predetermined location. And so it was, it was her fault? Uh, no, I, I, I don't want, you know, see, that's where everybody feels that, that we're looking to, to but, blame. But I asked you what happened. No. You said that she deviated from the plan. Well, and that's, that's where, uh, whenever the plan started going, uh, south, if you want to say, uh, where, where we lost contact with, with Rachel because she did not show up at, at the location she was supposed to have gone to. I feel like it's, it's just a byproduct of him being extremely uncomfortable with the questions being asked, but. Good. He should be uncomfortable. Chief Jones said that his apartment was not responsible for Rachel's death. And he said, quote, do we feel responsible? We're responsible for the safety of this community. So is Rachel not part of the community? This makes absolutely no sense. They called Rachel a criminal, even though she had never been convicted of a crime. That's what pisses me off the most, how often the word criminal is thrown out there about Rachel. Oh, my God. They very heavily implied that Rachel brought this whole thing upon herself because she broke the law. It's all her fault. Of course, they're going to say, we're not trying to put blame. We're not trying to assign fault. But they're saying it with their words. They are fully blaming her. Here's Chief Jones speaking on Rachel's history. Rachel Hoffman was committing crimes in the, in the city of Tallahassee. Yes, she was. Police Chief Dennis Jones says Rachel Hoffman was no innocent. The 23-year-old woman that you're talking about was, was a college graduate, and she was making a living off of, uh, off of selling illegal drugs. Making That's my job girl. as a police chief is to find these criminals in, in our community and to take them off the street to make the proper arrest. Let me make a note that it is not unusual to have known drug dealers or users offer to assist police in narcotics investigations. Rachel was no exception. Her parents think that you're now smearing her reputation to protect uh, and your own. That is not, uh, our hearts go out to the, to the Hoffman family. But, they, but here you are, you're essentially describing her as a criminal. Yeah, yes. And, and, she's, and been, she's been convicted of what? Nothing at this point. She uh, been was convicted uh, of a civil crime? No, she, well, Nothing. as far as she was in a drug diversion program, but no. But has she has been convicted of a single crime. To this point, of. no, sir, she has not. And you're calling her a drug criminal. Mm, I'm calling her a criminal. And so anybody in the drug court you think is a criminal? They're, they, if they are selling drugs, if they are using drugs, they are violating the law. So a drug user is a criminal? Yes, they are. Wow. What's most important to keep in mind is this. In this country, we have a constitutional right to due process, and we are constitutionally protected against cruel and unusual punishment. So why was Rachel essentially sentenced to death for a crime that she wasn't even convicted of? Because they saw an opportunity to take advantage of this girl mm -hmm. and use her for their own satisfaction and rewards, mm -hmm. clearly. Yep. Because a lot of people have been like, hell no, I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. Especially if they were able to consult with an attorney about this, any attorney would have been like, mm -hmm. no way you're doing this for them. There's other ways to go about dealing with these charges and likely they would have probably been significantly reduced had she been able to go through that due process the police robbed her of that right, essentially. Robbed her. And of her life. Of her life, yeah. 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 As you heard in the clips, they said that she made a living off selling drugs, which could not be farther from the truth. Her dad essentially paid for most things, her rent, her car, and gift cards for grocery shopping. And Rachel wasn't selling nearly enough weed to pay bills. But police initially tried to say that Rachel was selling 35 pounds of weed per Holy. month. Yep, that On was what, what they claimed. Evidence? If that were true, Rachel would have been taking home $1.2 to $1.5 million a year in 2007. And it was abundantly clear to everyone, except for the police somehow, that Rachel did not live the lifestyle of someone who made over a million dollars tax-free selling drugs. This makes no fucking sense. No, that's shocking that they would even say that because that would also imply she likely would have known these two guys. Yeah. They were selling weed and drugs as well. There's there would likely have been a relationship there. They would have or she would have been they would have been taking down people even higher than her. I mean, that it's, it's just. 
It's absurd. It's a smear campaign is what mm -hmm. it is. They're trying to make her look as bad yep. as possible in order How can to convince the public try to like mm -hmm. justify what happened. Yep. That's how they do it. Sanity. As we are outraged by this, many in the community were just blown away and infuriated to hear how the Tallahassee Police Department essentially let Rachel be murdered. They should have moved in as soon as the plan deviated, they should have moved in lights and sirens, go and find her as quickly as possible, knowing that she's going to go buy a weapon from these two felons. Like they knew how dangerous this was. And yet they chose to do nothing. Students at Florida state university held a March in Rachel's honor to protest the police department's handling of the case and the government's war on drugs. Rachel was laid to rest on May 13, 2008 and given a Jewish burial. Over 800 people attended Rachel's funeral, showing just how loved and missed she is. Her friends and family used butterflies as a symbol to remember Rachel. An internal investigation into how the Tallahassee Police Department handled Rachel's case was performed. It found officers had committed at least 21 violations of nine separate policies in Rachel's case. And you would think after hearing that, there would be some punishment, there'd be some consequences for doing that. It's Honestly, kind of crazy to me that they even like uh, found as many policy violations because I feel like a lot of times with the police, when there's internal investigations, they're like, you know, we investigated ourselves and found we did nothing wrong. Right? Yes. So it must be pretty, pretty freaking bad if you have that many violations. But, you know, yeah, justice was not did not follow the, that report. So. Nope. Nope. Rachel had told her friend Liza that she was working as a confidential informant. And after her death, Liza told investigators that Rachel had said one of the officers asked her out for a drink. Rachel told the officer no and that she had a boyfriend. The internal investigator said they asked every Tallahassee Police Department vice investigator if they asked Rachel out. And of course, each of them replied no. Of course they are going to say no. What are they going to admit to it? No. And I'm sure you did a thorough investigation Yeah. in bullshit. The vice investigator, Ryan Pender, was fired from the Tallahassee Police Department, and he got a job after that working for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. But he was the only one from the police department fired as a result of Rachel's murder. Other officers were suspended or reprimanded. But Ryan appealed his dismissal. In court, he placed all the blame on Rachel. This is just shocks me to my core, but he literally shed tears, not for her, but for himself and his job. He said things like, to get my career back that I worked eight and a half years for, Shut I've up. learned a tremendous amount more than I thought I would have learned from this. And this is, this is just even more infuriating. Just months after he was fired, an arbitrator ruled that he should be reinstated. So not only was he rehired by Tallahassee Police Department, but they also gave him back pay, meaning he essentially profited off of Rachel's murder. I mean, he did. He absolutely did. This is mind blowing. I know. It's like, okay, so Rachel dies because you guys fucked this whole thing up. And it's like, mm, well, she was selling drugs and doing drugs. Mm -hmm. The law is mm -hmm. law. She broke yep. the law. Oh, well, mm -hmm. too bad. And then these police officers are going to break laws and go against policies. And then they be like, oh, it's not great. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, you can actually have your job back. It's yeah, fine. Let's bring him back right. and pay him. Right, for all the time he lost. Mm -hmm. So Insane. the hypocrisy is just astounding. It really is. And it just, it really goes with the whole narrative, like the police are above the law in the sense. Oh yeah, for sure. She's a criminal, but they're not. Right. A law called Rachel's Law was proposed to tighten restrictions on the use of confidential informants and protect them better. The original version of the law wanted to ban the use of juveniles as confidential informants not use people in drug treatment programs, and give CIs a right to legal counsel. All seem fairly reasonable to me. The law also wanted to introduce offense parity, so low-level dealers shouldn't be used to bust traffickers and offenders with a history of violence. Also a no-brainer. You would think that would already be in place, a law yeah, like that. right. Police lobbying groups, of course, pitched a hissy fit over it. The Leon County Sheriff said the bill passing would be, quote, and it's always this doom and gloom, Mm -hmm. The end of law enforcement. Yep. The end of, of laws. Course, right. We can't <laughs> do this the fuck? way that we want to do it. That exploits people. Then this is the end of law enforcement. Okay, bro. 
So the law ended up having to be watered down in order to get passed, but it did eventually pass on May 7, 2009, two years to the date that Rachel was murdered and signed into law by the Florida governor. The law requires police to adopt reasonable protective measures for CIs, which who even knows what that means. Give CIs the opportunity to talk with an attorney before signing anything and submit data on CIs annually to the Department of Law Enforcement. So definitely some wins there, but I feel like it's so mm -hmm. watered down that yeah. what, is it even going to be an enforced law? I mean, all we really got were things that should have already been in place that any citizen would think is already in place. But right. you'd be shocked. Zanello Bradshaw was found guilty of first degree murder and given life in prison. Andre Green later worked out a deal to plead no contest to second degree murder and robbery with a firearm in exchange the death penalty was taken off the table and he is also serving life in prison without the possibility of parole, which I think are both, you know, definitely do punishments for both of them. Rachel's parents filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Tallahassee and in 2012, the city settled with Irv and Margie for $2.6 million and issued a formal apology. Obviously, the money and the formal apology don't mean much to her parents after losing their only daughter. I cannot imagine how angry you would be, how, I mean, I don't know if I would ever recover from something like this, from, from my child dying in such a preventable, such a violent way. It's just hard to even wrap your mind around being in that situation. And Rachel's mother's mental health got very bad after her daughter passed. She sometimes had episodes where she believed she was Rachel. However, according to one of Rachel's friends, this has gotten better as the years have gone on. For three years, Irv would sit at Rachel's grave every day. He would bring water for her flowers, scissors to keep the stems neat, and a book to read next to her grave. Here's a clip of her parents talking about losing Rachel. They took our daughter from us by doing a botched job. No parent should ever have to go through this again. Everything's different. I wake up feeling uh, sad. I wake up sometimes tearful. I wake up knowing that my daughter uh, is gone. They played this very underhanded, shady game with her, and it cost her her life. If you're listening, that piano that you're hearing is actually Rachel playing, and it's, God, it's so eerie to hear her. Ugh, it's just so sad. I cannot imagine. I feel so bad for them. Rachel's family ended up creating the Rachel Morningstar Foundation, which is an organization that advocates for CI reform. Irv also had a scholarship in Rachel's name created. In Rachel's memory, the Purple Hatter's Ball was created, as you heard us mention in the beginning Rachel loved to wear this iconic fuzzy purple hat when she went to shows and so that was created in her honor it's an annual music festival held at the spirit of Sewanee Music Park in Live Oak Florida the site of some of Rachel's favorite music festivals and all artists playing are bands that Rachel knew and loved or are in line with her music tastes the festival actually hasn't happened since 2018 but it was held every year for 11 years we definitely want to hear your thoughts on this one, um, what you believe the police should have done differently, what responsibility they should have took, or if you're on their side. I'd like to hear why, because I know there are people out there that are. With that being said, we're going to go and wrap up today's episode here with a clip from one of the FSU marches, and in it, one of her relatives uh, is reading the eulogy that Margie wrote for Rachel. But we will see you guys next week. My aunt couldn't make it today. She's having obviously a hard time. She just lost her only daughter. So she asked me to read her eulogy that she wrote yesterday for those of you that couldn't make it to Tampa for the funeral. I lost my voice screaming as loud and as long as I could while driving my Saturn to Tallahassee. I dreaded this day of her funeral. All I have thought about has been how much I love Rachel, and I will continue to love Rachel for as long as I live. Remember her big smile, her love for music, and her dancing, her love for others with all the pictures of her hanging on someone, her nurturing spirit in cooking, her mischievous sense of humor, her vitality, her enthusiasm, and her love for life.